Anna and I took our first trip to New Mexico. We went partly in search of Georgia O'Keeffe and partly to encounter a new landscape and partly to visit and stay at a working Benedictine monastery called Christ in the Desert, which Anne wanted to use as a mini retreat and where I would compose. However, that was not the part of the trip that ended up having the greatest effect on me. That happened before we even got to the monastery on our first day in the Albuquerque Museum. At first we thought it was going to be your standard exhibition, lots of artifacts, photographs, reconstructions of ancient villages, etc., etc. But on the very first information panel, we read about a Native American tribal leader who had led a successful rebellion against the Spanish in 1680. We looked at each other. We knew that there had always been skirmishes between the indigenous peoples and the colonizers, but a successful rebellion? That wasn't part of the Eurocentric history we had been taught. We had no idea that there had been a revolution in America almost a century before 1776. Why isn't that story told in schools? Why is it hardly known outside New Mexico? I was hooked. As we walked through the rest of the exhibition, I became more and more excited and as we exited out into the bright New Mexico sunshine, I looked at Anne and said, what a great opera that would make. I've spent the last seven years writing that opera. I bought every book I could find using as many Pueblo sources as I could and doing my best to filter out the pro-Spanish bias of most of the contemporary written accounts. By the way, Pueblo is the Spanish word for people and they use it to describe the Native American villages also giving them a Christian saint's name, hence the San Juan Pueblo, for example. The Native American word for Pueblo is Owinge, and the name of the San Juan Pueblo was officially changed back to its pre-colonial name, Ok Owinge, in 2005. But I would probably use the term Pueblo during this talk. Here's the background I gleaned about Pueblo's revolt. In July 1598, Juan de Oñate headed north from Mexico with 500 Spanish settlers and soldiers, about 7,000 head of cattle, and founded a Spanish settlement near the Rio Grande as a remote colony from Mexico. He was eventually appointed as its first governor that he named Santa Fe de Nuevo Mexico, the holy faith of New Mexico. He immediately set about extracting as much wealth from the region as he could by the traditional methods of conquerors, most of which do not survive the scrutiny of modern sensibilities. Oñate was succeeded by Pedro de Peralta, who moved the main base of operations to a city he called Santa Fe in 1610, making it the oldest capital city in the United States. The city needed to be near a water supply, in this case the Rio Grande, but there was already a people there, the Native American tribe called the Tezuque, who were there for the same reason, they needed to be near the water. Peralta simply appropriated the land, moving the Native American village about 15 miles north, making Santa Fe also the first forced relocation in American history. Franciscan missionaries accompanied the conquistadores, and they too were determined to benefit from the original inhabitants, both in forms of souls one for God, either by willing or forced conversions, and in the building of Christian churches, Christian churches by slave labor. Their presence also set up a considerable rivalry between the secular and sacred branches of government, which often expressed itself in the form of competitive cruelty towards the native inhabitants. It must be remembered that the Spanish Inquisition was at full force at the time, and although they were very distant from Spain, the Franciscans in the New World were determined not to be found wanting in zeal. This rivalry came to a head in the late 1650s when Governor Bernardo López de Mendizabal forbade Franciscans to practice encomiendas, the, famous, the infamous system of forced work without pay, and granted the Native Americans permission to follow their own religious practices without punishment. This enraged and frustrated the Franciscans, who petitioned both the Spanish authorities in Mexico and the Pope in Europe to have Mendizabal arrested and tried by the Inquisition. After that debacle, Future governors were distinctly cautious about crossing the clerics, and rising native discontent became more and more focused on the religious intolerance and excesses of the church. While some were re reconciled to the situation, intermarrying and recognizing that the presence of the Spanish soldiers did protect them to a certain extent from raids by other tribes, there were more who resented the cultural and religious intolerance. 
After Mendithaval, their religious practices were once more outlawed and punished severely if discovered. Their kivas, which is their sacred underground rooms, were destroyed and refusing to convert was once again punished harshly, often by whippings and amputations. Unrest among the Pueblos came to a head in 1675, amplified by a severe drought, which had caused a famine and extreme hardship for everyone. Timbers were, to say the least, frayed. Sensing, sensing unrest, the governor attempted to nip it in the bud, ordering the arrest of 47 Pueblo leaders, four of whom were sentenced to death. Three were hanged, one committed suicide before he could be hanged, and many of the other remaining 43 were publicly flogged. When news of this came to the Pueblo villages, many of them immediately moved in force and surrounded Santa Fe, demanding the release of the captives. Because a large part of the resident army happened to be elsewhere at the time, the governor had no choice but to comply. One of the Native American medicine men who he had freed was from Okeawinge. His name was Pope, and he is the main character in my opera. After his release, Pope moved to Taos to recover from his wounds. It is there, it is said, he plotted his revenge. That's the thumbnail portrait of the historical background leading up to the events of my opera. The, the chronology of the rebellion itself is fairly simple. Pope developed an ingenious method of, of coordinating a simultaneous attack to overwhelm the Spanish by sheer force of numbers. After deciding which Pueblos would be involved in the uprising, and not all of them were, runners would be sent out with a number of knotted ropes. Each evening, a knot would be untied either by the runners on their journey or at the Pueblo after they had continued on to the next. On the morning after the last knot was untied, each Pueblo would rise up and kill or otherwise disable any Spanish in their area and then march on Santa Fe to lay down the siege. In spite of the fact that two of the runners were captured and tortured by the Spanish before the plan could be carried out, new runners were dispatched in their place to activate the plan, to activate the plan immediately. As Pope predicted, with superior numbers, it was successful. Santa Fe was soon besieged, the water supply cut off, and the Spanish forced to retreat rather than die of thirst. The remaining inhabitants of Santa Fe were allowed to leave, taking whatever belongings they could carry with them. While that's a good story, it is in itself not enough material for an opera. Since it is mostly about the physical events, runners and battles, it might make a good film, but it would be exceedingly hard to show on stage. Operas and plays are much better either at showing how people feel and how that informs what they do, or how they react to what is done to them. It's the relationship between the characters and the events that creates the drama. An actor killing someone on stage is interesting for a few seconds, but it is not dramatic. Knowing why they do it, wondering whether they will do it or not, is where the drama lies. Tell us that there was once a king who thought that only two of his three daughters loved him, and we just say, so what? Show us why this happens how he reacts and how he is eventually psychically destroyed when he realizes what was really going on. And the play King Lear will be beloved for 400 years. How could the bare bones of the story of Pope's revolt be transformed into one that would engage an audience for a stage production? First of all came the realization that the story, the libretto in opera speak, would have to be written by me. This was partly because I had no money to pay anyone else to do it, but mostly because I could hardly expect someone else to do the hours and hours of research and give up their own creative time necessary for such a large scale project without the prospect of a performance at the end of the process. I had two hurdles, two hurdles to overcome. One, since people didn't know the story, I needed to present the context of the story without being it just a history lesson. And two, there would be little drama if the way I did it was just Native American good, Spanish bad. We already know that, and that's a documentary, not theatre. Moreover, such a black and white version of history is rarely the truth. The participants need to have development to change and be changed for there to be any interest. 
In the end, the solution to both these problems was accomplished by adding characters who could embody the history and context by presenting it as their own experience. That is a fairly standard technique in drama writing, and I'll come back to that in a bit. The bigger problem was how to portray Pope Hay, the main character. My research, both in the books and in talking to people at the Pueblos, soon revealed that there are at least two views of Pope. For some, he was a warrior leader, not unlike King Arthur, who rallied the tribes and led them to glory. For others, mostly at Okeawinge, he was purely a spiritual leader, and as such, forbidden from being involved in violence. An analogue in our own times might be a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King, and Pope is equally revered. Yet, at their own casino in Okeowinge, they proudly display the famous statue of Pope holding one of the knotted ropes, the system developed by him, which led to the Spanish being overthrown. How is that not involved? It seemed to be an irreconcilable inconsistency. And here is where it gets complicated. If I told the story of a King Arthur like Pope, I would offend the people in Okeowinge. If I made him a more Gandhi like figure, it would be to ignore the element of freedom fighter that made him beloved among many Pueblos. Imagine telling the story of the American War of Independence with George Washington staying at home in his church just praying for victory instead of heroically leading his troops across the Delaware. The question is how does a writer balance opposing versions of history? Or to put it another way, who owns a story? How, could I, how should I navigate between competing, na competing Native American narratives? For a long time, I struggled with the thought that whichever I chose would be wrong for somebody. I was also really aware that for the first time in my life, the color of my skin might be part of how my actions were interpreted. In the second decade of the 21st century, it is impossible not to be aware that, as the composer-librettist of this opera, I was a white man telling a story about brown-skinned people. Simply put, in one sense, it's not my story to tell. But the subject of that story is at the very beginning of the deep racial divisions in America. A division caused by the belief that racial superiority was determined by skin color and religion, by the very idea that racial superiority is even possible. This division was created by people who look like me, and it ultimately led to the doctrine of manifest destiny, which in turn led to the breaking of one-sided treaties that were in reality merely a fig leaf for what would now be called ethnic cleansing. It is a division that is, in many ways, both still current and yet invisible to too many people. The story of Pope is about the havoc that was wreaked upon the indigenous population and the results from the running of pipelines or border walls through sacred lands to insensitive sports mascots. These results are so interwoven in the fabric of modern American life that many don't even see them. In that sense, this story and the history behind it is everybody's story. It, as, it is as American a story as George Washington or Martin Luther King, and as complicated. In the words of Enrique La Madrid, Professor Emeritus at the University of New Mexico, with whom I discuss my project, Pope is our national hero who taught all of us the well-fought lessons of cultural resistance. For almost half a century, for almost a century and a half, poets, historians, journalists, and politicians have considered him as a cultural and political hero for all new Mexicans. His defiance of the Spanish colloquial invaders from the South became an inspiration to later generations, both Hispano and Pueblo, for the resistance of the second wave of colonialism coming from the East, from the United States. Pope's story is part of America's story. One might almost say it was part of America's story before America was America. It has shaped us in ways we probably don't even recognize. Having said that, I did not want my opera to be a mea culpa or a political diatribe. The characters in it, both historical and fictional, needed to be shaped as we all are by hysterical context, historical context, by the events surrounding them, and, and inevitably 
simply by the way they are wired as human beings. My aim was to tell a story in the most engaging way I could and let the audience take from it what they will. The moment everything fell into place was the realization that I didn't have to take sides in the war leaders, spiritual leader debate. I could do both. If I made that dichotomy, Pope's own inner struggle, I could show a Pope who was the inspiration for the rebellion, providing its spiritual underpinnings. I could show how he came to believe that removing the Spanish was the only way the Pueblo culture could survive. But I didn't have to show him as personally leading the rebellion. I could show a character arc that began with him uncertain about military action, but ending up feeling that he had no choice. I could show the struggles of a real person, which is infinitely more interesting than the actions of a great leader who never has an iota of self-doubt. To articulate that character arc, I invented a sister for him. It seems that the historical Pope did actually have a sister, but the one I invented for him is not that person. Kutsai, whose name translates to either white corn or yellow corn, depending on how you pronounce it, was much younger, idealistic, and probably quite naive. She always appeals to Pope's better nature, encouraging him to follow the ways of the great mother, which are essentially peaceful. I'll talk about Pueblo religion later. As the opera progresses, their conversations become more and more strained until they are in open conflict, which is painful for both of them. At the end, Pope has to choose between her and his sense of destiny, and it doesn't end well. I also realized early on that there needed to be a point of contact and interface between the Spanish and the Pueblo cultures. A storyline where there isn't even the possibility of reconciliation is one-dimensional and ultimately without tension. Clearly, that person couldn't be Pope, the implacable foe of the Spanish. But Kutsai's naivety was promising. I needed someone that could offer her another narrative, a rival to Pope for her admiration. Enter Pedro, a former nobleman turned priest, young, good-looking, and there not to plunder, but in his own words, for the spiritual care of the natives. He is an invented character, but the practice of second or third born sons of noble families entering the church has a long history. Pedro's function is manifold. He is the only sympathetic Spaniard. His shock at the cruelty he observes towards the Pueblos brings him to a moment of crisis. Perhaps the Christianity of the Franciscans is not God's way. Three, this realization happens at the same time as Kutsai's questioning of Pope's motives and opens up the possibility of true intercultural dialogue, a possibility that is cruelly snatched away by the events of the opera. And four, Pope experiences the developing friendship between Pedro and Kutsai as a personal, cultural, and religious betrayal. Thus, their friendship presents the audience with another motivation for Pope to start a, a, a revolution, to save his sister's honor, the best possible motivation, or simply revenge, the worst. The other characters I invented were a crone or wise woman who healed Pope after he was whipped in 1675. She creates a the prophecy, one day Pope will lead us, but the way of peace will not be his path. She also provides the audience with Pope's backstory and so the first seeds of doubt in Kutsai about Pope's motives. Then there is a captain of the garrison and two Franciscans whose principal function is to show the concrete examples of cruelty towards the Native Americans. And lastly, there is a quintet of women of the Pueblos who give much needed comic relief in Act Two and comment sadly on the state of affairs in the final scene of Act Three. Historical figures make up the rest of the cast though the words they say are mine. Before I briefly describe how the libretto combines the historical and imagined characters, I must address the final and most difficult issue I faced in writing the opera. In a time when issues surrounding cultural appropriation are raised with increasing frequency, even though there doesn't seem to be a consensus of exactly how to define it, too often it's used as a generic pejorative rather than a substantive caveat. As an Anglo telling a story about Pueblo people, I needed to be hyper-vigilant about its pitfalls. This is especially the case regarding Native American religion. 
Pueblo religious practices are secret. Even at the dances that are openly held for the public, any recording or photography is strictly prohibited. Anne and I were at one a couple of years ago, and when someone had forgotten to put his phone in airplane mode and received a call in the middle of a dance, he was immediately surrounded by young men who politely but very firmly ensured that the phone was turned off immediately and returned to his pocket after that they had checked that he had taken no pictures or video. The problem was that I was writing a story in which religion was the prime motivator for two of the main characters. To ignore that would have been to reduce them to two-dimensional beings, not fully realized characters. For Pope, it would have been as disfiguring as amputating an arm or a leg. In other words, I had to come up with a very convincing fake, credible enough for the characters to sound authentic, but clearly distant enough from actual Pueblo practices to avoid offense. In my research, I came across translations of Hopi songs transcribed by early ethnographers in the 20s and 30s, which are either borrowed direct or freely adapted. Where I didn't borrow phrases, their rhythms and general style helped provide the flavor or tone without being culturally specific to the Pueblos. The great mother that Kutsai reveres, and to whose guidance she tries to persuade Pope to return, is purely a mashup of my own imagination. She is a generic combination of different traditions, earth-based spiritualities from Celtic to African animism. She is an amalgam that seems to me to be a transcultural expression of faith. In the opera, she inspires in Kutsai a faith that is to be envied and is not only a key component of the unfolding drama, but a much needed counterpoint to the rigid type of weaponized Christianity evidenced by the Spanish colonists. I do once refer to a traditional Tewa religious figure, the god Puseyemu, who, according to Pueblo traditions, was an important figure for Pope. But, like the great mother, Puseyemu never speaks and is not represented in any way. Their characters only refer to him in the same way that the Spanish characters refer to God. It is the character's relationship with these deities that is important. So that's the DNA of my story. A main hero struggling with internal demons, a naive idealistic younger sister, a freshly minted priest whose eyes and heart are open, not closed by intolerance and racism, a cynical governor aided and abetted by both army and the church in a context of colonialism and cultural imperialism. A story from history, but sadly dealing with the themes that are all too relevant today. Now, I don't know how we are for time, but I've got about five minutes where I briefly describe how the story works out. Would that be of interest or, I, or have I already gone too long? I'm seeing thumbs. I'm assuming, like the fighters in the Colosseum, that that's a good thing. So, anyway, here is a brief synopsis of the story of my opera. If you are interested in reading more, you can go to my website and find a more detailed synopsis. In fact, the whole libretto, if you're brave enough, under the Pope pull-down menu. Act one. Kutsai tells of how when the Spanish arrived, they were welcomed and peaceful. Only when they became numerous and new holy men arrived did they become cruel. The crone tells her she is naive if she thinks that Pope will persuade the Pan Spanish to leave peacefully or want to. The wounds they inflicted on him are too deep. The governor, captain, and the brothers squabble about who is more deserving of native slave labor. He grants the captain more to work in the fields and tells the brothers to stop punishing the natives who are building the new church until it is finished. He only does so because the injured can't work and therefore slows everything down. In the last scene of Act One, we meet Pope just finishing his morning ritual. A group of Pueblo leaders enters and tries to persuade him that the people are ready to rise up, but they lack a leader. Pope seems to turn aside the implied invitation to be that leader and suggests that while the time is not right now, one day it will be. At the beginning of Act Two, Kutsai is beginning to have doubts about Pope. She wonders which metaphorical fork in the road he will take. He reveals that he is beginning to see no way out of armed conflict. Their disagreement is left unresolved. Later, 
Pedro and Kutsai talk, and Pedro confesses, confesses that the behavior of the Spanish has caused him to doubt his faith. He says, for years we have been taught that it is an act of love to bring the wayward back into the fold. But when I hear the screams, when their blood flows so freely, I don't see love, I only see death and degradation. Unbeknownst to them, Hopi has been watching. And when Pedro leaves, he confronts Kutsai. How can you give yourself to a white skin? She angrily retorts that she has not, and that she is not so consumed with hatred that she cannot see where there is good. This gives Pope a pause, and for a moment the audience might hope that he has changed his mind. But he takes the other fork. How can I rest while the white skins are in our land? How can we be free? He has made his decision. In the last scene of this act, Pope's plan is revealed and the male chorus sing, it is time to let the snake loose. The opening of act three shows the governor, the captain, and the brothers again discussing how the Spanish must give a show of force to reassert their authority. Pedro counsels against this, and the captain questions his loyalty. When the governor realizes that Pedro has become friendly with Pope's sister, he is alarmed and finally realizes the danger they are in. He orders the arrest of all the tribal leaders except Pope and warns Pedro to stay away from Kutsai. Defying the governor's orders, this is an opera, he had to defy the governor's orders. Pedro seeks her out. It is obvious they have become closer, but neither is ready to admit to themselves that the attraction is anything other than intellectual. This is one of my favorite scenes. When Pedro describes the love of God, Kutsai replies, we know that love, but give it a different name. I don't understand why a name is so important. Pedro replies, perhaps we must look beyond the name. Apart from reflecting my own theology, I included this in the scene for two reasons. One, I believe there can't be reconciliation unless we attempt to understand other cultures. And that seems to be a lesson we still haven't learned. And two, while both Pedro and Kutsai might be hopelessly unrealistic and naive, for a brief moment, we glimpse a view of a possible future what could have happened if both sides hadn't been so entrenched. This will heighten the drama of the events that follow. They finished the scene with a duet to a text borrowed from the German mystic Meister Eckhart. Despite being written in the 13th century, his words are almost modern. The eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one eye, one seeing, one love. I think Kutsai and Pedro are the only two in the room who don't realize it is a love duet. She gives him a token of the great mother, and yes, that is a transparent plot device. The rebellion happens off stage, and Pope's lieutenants inform him, inform him that it has been successful. There is general celebration which Kutsai happily joins. However, her joy is short-lived when she learns that the priests were killed. When she sees the token she had given Pedro around the neck of one of Pope's lieutenants, she realizes that Pedro is among them and she shuns Pope. She says, you are no longer my brother. From being his strongest booster, Kutsai has become his harshest critic. Whether it is out of concern for the future of the Pueblos or because of the loss of her unacknowledged love for Pedro is as unclear as Pope's motives for having Pedro killed. As a dramatist, I think leading the audience to contemplate motivations and reactions of which the characters themselves may be unaware is more satisfying than spelling things out. Life is messy and art is less honest when it cleans it up. Pope is devastated, yet despite the personal cost, he remains convinced that he chose the right path. Eventually he pulls himself together and sings, this heart, this broken drum, whose once proud rhythms stutter and fail must make now a new music. I have foregone a sister's love for this. Tomorrow we will take feathers and corn pollen and in freedom offer them to the gods. In some ways the opera could have ended there. I thought about it for a long time, but what has become the legend of Pope didn't end there. 
History tells us that after the revolt, the promised age of gold did not materialize. The drought didn't end. The Pueblos were not able to maintain the level of unity that they had displayed during the uprising. They returned to their religious practices, but the great reawakening that many hoped for did not happen. The Spanish record has Pope establishing a despotic reign, riding around and demanding tribute, annulling Christian marriages and forbidding the speaking of Spanish. The motivations for portraying him in that way are not hard to imagine. In truth, no one knows what happened to him after the rebellion. Like King Arthur, one minute he is there, gone the next. But the Spanish did return in 1692. And I thought it an important part of the story, so there is one more scene. Set 12 years later, the women are in full lament. They say, we are forgetting who we are. We have lost Pope, the world is changing, we are changing. They look to Kutsai to be their new spiritual leader, but her final aria and the end of the opera reveals that she cannot. She is too broken. She sings, when the rain comes, I will go walking in the fields. I will climb up into the mountains and ride the clouds, my feet on the wind, my arms stretched wide, and my heart worn out with love, at rest at last. After she has finished singing, Spanish troops are seen in the distance. End of opera. So. Thank you, Andrew. I think we have about 10 minutes to open it for um, about uh, questions that people may have. And if we could use the raising hands feature and you can locate it in the participants um, logo at the icon I'm, I mean, at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you could please raise your hand, you will see a list of the participants and at the bottom of that list, the raising hands feature. You click on that one and I'll be calling it. So we have um, Ruth Rose or David Rose. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry, this is David. Um, wow, that was amazing, Simon. I've never, uh, never understood how something like this happens, I have to say. That was wonderful. Um, I, do could you take a couple of minutes though to talk about the music? Um, I thought you'd be talking about music, and I've always wondered how do people like you, you know, what? How do they interrelate? Do you ever realize there's a piece here where the music is going to come first, and I'm going to bend my lyrics and so on? How oh, did yes. you make the intersection between the this incredible story and the music? Um, in some ways, it was a real pain in the bottom to have to write all the words. <laughs> and in some ways, it made it infinitely easier because if when I came to write the music, I didn't like a word or was the wrong number of syllables or something, I could just change it. I didn't have to go to someone else and ask them to be creatively flexible and have to deal with egos. I just had to say to myself, well, you got that wrong, didn't you? And change it. It was so much easier. And writing the words myself also gave me the opportunity to repeat certain phrases and to have some kind of musical connection between those phrases so that the, the form of the music sometimes comes out of the words. And that just makes the whole purpose um, so much easier. And the other thing that was really easy, uh, what helped was I when I wrote the words for a scene, it was nearly always five times too many words. When you start realizing how many notes that's going to be, you think, oh, I can cut this, I can cut this. So it makes you be very, um, it forces you to be concise as a writer. And um, I've seen quite a few 20th, 20th and 21st century operas and so many of them have just too many words. <laughs> So it was to do that kind of refining process at the, at, at the same time actually proved to be a very rich experience. Mm. Wow. If that makes sense. Great. Uh, thanks very much. We have Meharry. Hi, Simon. Um, I really Dave. enjoyed the talk. I also was curious about the musical side. And 
um, including the fact, have you released any portions of like choruses or that kind of thing for people to start performing? Or are you um, it all for the end? Uh, oh no, um, uh, the, uh, for April the 18th, um, we had a, a scenes program scheduled at the Belmont Church. I had singers hired and pianists hired, and we were gonna um, perform all the scenes with just the three main characters in it. But clearly it was a, it was a victim of COVID. So, uh, which was very frustrating, but um, it was it absolutely the decision that had to be made. Um, like Benjamin Britten did in Peter Grimes, there are orchestral interludes. Another thing when you're writing an opera is you have to realize if you're changing of scenes, you, if you don't want anything to stop, and be silent while they change the scenes and close the curtain. You have to write music for all those joining bits. And so there are four um, interludes, um, which are purely orchestral. And my computer program makes a, a fairly decent job of those. So those are again on my website, which you can listen to them. I would have played one of them today, but getting a decent sound through a Zoom conference is quite challenging. and. Um, if anyone who really is brave enough to want to do that can just do it on the on the on the um, pull down menu on my website, which is simonwandrews.com. So, so the opera in its entirety is available on your web website. Only the instrument, the, all the words are, and all the background, um, a more detailed background than I gave today. Um, but not the computer can only make instrumental sounds; it can't make um, vocal sounds. So only the orchestral music is up there yet until it's performed live. Then I can record that and put that up there. Looking, looking forward to uh, hearing and maybe even have a, a small chance to participate in some of that. I would love that. Thank you. I would love that. Thank you. We have now a question from Meg. Can you unmute yourself, please? OK. Very good. Uh, boy, I am so impressed, Simon. It is, uh, what a story. And I can't imagine anyone else having been able to write it because you internalized it so deeply. I did. One thing I wonder is, um, seven years is a long time and a lot has happened. And I've wondered whether, um, with the events that have transpired since then, like the, uh, or even the, the Me Too events, the year or two that when that was so big in the news and killings by police people and so forth, uh, did, that, did any of that make you change your characters a bit? Um. No, because I think the way the Spanish treated the Native Americans is uncomfortably close <laughs> to the yeah. way certain policemen have treated African Americans. Yeah. And or anyone who isn't white or just poor people. Um, when you have a policeman that can shoot a disabled man in a wheelchair in the face with a rubber bullet, you're essentially not that distant from 1680s New Mexico. So in some ways, what was depressing about this opera was the fact that, as I said, in some ways, we haven't learned very much in 370 years or whatever it is. And what I hope that the audience will take, if, if and when this is performed, what I hope the audience will, be, um, will take from this will be that um, you don't have to look 400 years back to see this behavior still taking place. And that it really is a, a current that's run, a, a thread, a, a very rich seam that has, that has um, run through this country since 100 years before it was America. And so in that way, it seems very, very relevant. And I can address those issues without setting it in 2021. <laughs> somebody else will write the opera about George Floyd. I am not that person. But somebody else will, will write that opera. Though I am writing a choral piece at the moment called I Can't Breathe. 
but that's an, that's another story. We have a question from Joanne. Could you um, unmute yourself? Thank, Thank you. you. What an amazing birth story <laughs> over over so many years. Uh, I'm I have a question, I guess, about uh, those of us that kind of dwell in being concerned about identity and cultural appropriation and humility. Um, I'm just wondering about like how do you know that you got it right, like? was any confirmation or a member check or groups that you shared with that you know sort of gave you some sense uh, who are insiders you know from from our outsider perspectives um the simple answer is i don't know whether i've got it right um and in the same way that there are multiple versions of Pope's story within the Pueblo culture and the Native American culture. Um, some, as I said, some see him as a glorious war leader. Some s see him just as a spiritual leader. They could see the same story and come to completely different conclusions. Um, what I tried very hard to do, and only other people will be able to tell me whether I have been successful, is that I worked tirelessly to make sure that my story is not about being Native American. It's about story people, it's, about, it's as much about being European as it is about being Native American. And it's the interface, the disastrous interface of those two cultures that the story is about. So I make no claims to being Native American any more than I make claims to being Spanish. And I hope in that way, that um, the stories about the characters, as I said in, in my remarks, no, it's not just Native American is good and Spanish is bad. Um, I'm sure there will be Native Americans that worry that I haven't made Pope positive enough. I've, been, I've made him a three-dimensional character with a nasty side to him. As a side, one element in his character that I didn't include in the story is that his real life sister was married to a Spanish sympathizer. And even the Native Americans say that he had his brother-in-law killed to maintain the secrecy of the plot. So I didn't want to go there, obviously. So I, I haven't tried to make him just as, you know, this kind of Charlton Heston figure. <sighs> um, but he's a real person who happens to be Native American. So, and where the cultural appropriation insensitivity line is different for everyone. And if you worry about that too much, ultimately, you, I never would have written a note or a word. And I think this is a story that people need to know. People need to know that the beginning of this country was not the idealistic, democratic, liberty, fraternity, and equality for everyone as all, all countries make those myths about themselves and all countries should challenge those myths. That was, apart from being a rollicking good story, that was an important motivation for me. Thank you. We have the last question from Dom Cohen. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, hey, Dom. A couple of words know? about, oh, you want to, no, no, gonna, go no. we'll fight <laughs> over this, you know, all this news. <laughs> Um, I want to say a couple of words about the musical style in in terms of how much of it is just the style you're accustomed to writing and how much you try to incorporate elements from Pueblo music, real or imagined. Um, one of the first musical decisions I made was that I was going to stay so far away from anything representing Native American music, I was in a different time zone. Um, the only, I, I'm, that would seem to me to be falling into the trap, exactly the trap that Joanne was just describing and, and, and asked me about. I write, the music is my music in, in, in my style. Now, if you're really trying to be picky, the, after the overture, the first thing you hear is a flute, but it's not a Native American flute. 
and the men's chorus is accompanied by two bass drum, three bass drums in the house outside of the orchestra pit. But Native Americans are hardly the only culture that use drums. So um, it was important to me that it was my story and it should be filled with my British slash American slash European music. Um, uh, the biggest challenge for me musically was I've never written anything approaching this long. And it's, the opera is about two hours and 45 minutes without intermission, which is one of the reasons it took seven years to write. Um, so it was developing ways of writing on a larger scale that was um, a wonderful and very, very difficult challenge. Um, but if um, my music is kind of, well, I kind of, I think of it as extended tonality. Um, it's not in a key, it doesn't use scales, but it does use chords and what I think of as melodies and might have more of an idea of how to describe how difficult some of my melodies are. But once you know them, they kind of make sense because I've written a lot of music for Anne to sing and she does it beautifully. Um, but musically, it was very important that it should just be my voice and no, no other voices. I, I think that's the, um, the is that the question you're asking, Don? Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, for this wonderful um, presentation about the the story, the music, and your hard work with this. Thank you for sharing that with all of us. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's um, very kind. It's I don't get the chance to talk about it much, so I hope I haven't talked your ear off too much. Thank you for, for sharing with us. And thank you, everybody, for being with us. We will see you, hopefully, next week, uh, same time, 4.30. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everyone. Thank you.